Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just far too comfortable. <laughs> it was quite funny just outside. We had those little um, rigmarole about uh, what side Michael would sit on because um, uh, he always sits on, on this side, but this time he's, he's being interviewed and, uh, and not, not interviewing. But, uh, so I suppose the... Do you have a good side or a better side? Oh, I don't mind. You, know, you whatever. don't mind. <laughs> it's the old Hitchcock remark, isn't it, to the actors? So he was late, she was late on set and... Yeah, he's yeah. got found and said, what are you doing? He said, could you tell me which is my best side? He said, madam, you're sitting on it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, go on. Does it... It's very awkward because I want to turn around and otherwise you'll see the back of my head. Yeah, fantastically bad setup, I think. Yeah. It is. <laughs> <laughs> Badly Does... lit, too, by the way. <laughs> Does it feel surreal to be, for once, on the other side? No, I very much enjoy being, uh, being essentially a lazy person, being interviewed, because you don't have to work very hard. <laughs> the other poor sap opposite you is, is, a, is a guy who's got to do all the graft, and I rather enjoy it. People like talking about themselves, don't they? Well, I do, <laughs> as you'll find out. Good, yeah, that, that's why we're here. Um... I suppose I'd better get straight into it then. It was, when I was researching for this, it was quite interesting. I found a quote of yours where you said that when people ask you who you've most enjoyed interviewing, you, you can't answer. So that's my first question, crossed off. Um, but, but when people say, who was the most remarkable man you ever met, you always say without hesitation, Muhammad Ali. Mm. I was very lucky because in 1971, when I started doing the talk show for the very first time at the BBC, Muhammad Ali was coming into his prime. And I interviewed him five times in the next 11 years and, and chronicled not only the, 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 the success and, and the career of an extraordinary man and a great champion, yeah. but also his decline from being the most extraordinary athlete I've ever seen. I mean, the man was beautiful. There's no other word for it. I mean, he was beautiful. He had the most extraordinary hands that were long and tapered and belonged to a pianist rather than a, a prize fighter. Uh, and he was an engaging man, a funny man, and he could be provocative as well, as I discovered, and confrontational. But then we, did, we charted that decline. The last interview I did with him in 1982 was the very beginning, although we didn't know it at the time, of the decline into, into well, he's punched on, maybe Parkinson is most important, call it what you want. The fact of the matter is that he fought two or three fights too many. And you see the consequences now, sadly, mm. in his demeanor. And what was interesting was in that last interview I did in 82, where I asked him if he was frightened of becoming that stumble bum you see in, in all the boxing arenas in the world, the guys walking around with their cauliflower ears and noses and their eyes dead. And he got quite angry about this, and yet you could see in his eyes at that moment in time, you could see a change. I could see a change from the guy I'd met 10 years, 11 years before. The eyes had gone dead. And the terrifying thing about it, and about what happened to Muhammad Ali, is that after that interview, in which his speech was slightly slurred, and there was yeah. every indication he had slowed down. He kind of shuffled on. No, that's unfair. But he, he didn't come on as he bounced on before. He fought twice more. And he fought men away in 17, 18 stone who battered him. And so the consequence of that is what you see now. And the sadness of it is that boxing is in denial because if boxing ever admitted that the greatest fighter there's been can suffer damage like that, then anybody can. Yeah. And, of course, it's true. I mean, you can't make a any kind of moral justification for prize fighting at all, except to say, and I have to say this, that as somebody who's written about sport and follow sport all my life, that I've never actually been as thrilled, as moved, as when I was seeing him three times fight Joe Frazier. I mean, it was yeah. extraordinary drama. It was, it was theatre. It was, it was everything. Uh, and yet, as he reminded us at a press conference uh, on the eve of the second fight, he said, can I ask all you white guys a question, which was a press call. And we nodded, and he said... What are you white men doing, sitting here, he said, watching two black boys try to knock the hell out of each other? And it's a very good question. And it's one you have to ask yourself when you go to any boxing match. Yeah. Spe um, speaking of his fights with Joe Frazier, I understand that uh, one of them nearly occurred in a show where you were interviewing him. Uh, with, with Frazier? Yeah. Well, he did this extraordinary thing with Frazier. I mean, I mean he, he won Frazier. Frazier was, was a black man. Frazier was the son of a... Of a of a, of a cotton picker in Alabama. Yeah. By comparison, uh, Muhammad Ali was, was, was chocolate colored. I mean, he was, and he, because he had an Irish grandfather. Yeah. And the fact of the matter is that he would call him, he would call Fraser Uncle Tom, and that's sort of, And basically, it wasn't fair, and it wasn't true. And Fraser was unable to ar articulate his rage except in the ring. And of course, he got his own back there. But the fact of the matter was that if you'd cast the film, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, and Muhammad Ali walks through the door, yeah. you're okay. But if Joe Frazier walks through the door, it's a different proposition. Yeah. You know, and, and that's what Ali failed to see. Yeah, yeah. Quite deliberately. 
I mean, he, he, he played the race game. He played the race game all the time. I mean, he, he would do it with me. I mean, he would call me honky and all that sort of thing. <laughs> and uh, I'm not going to argue with Muhammad Ali, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> we, we had one spectacular row when uh, he did call me honky. It's the nicest thing because he was, for all his talk, his wonderful talk, and, and he was extraordinary. It was God's gift to the talk show host, I have to say. Mm-hmm. But he did have this, this, this extraordinary business where he was at best semi-literate. And I had a book which a, a man called Bud Schulberg had, had written, in which he said that in spite of all his posturing, he, Muhammad Ali, had more white friends than any other black fighter that he'd ever encountered. And, I, and Ali was ranting on about hating all white men, and I said to him, look, this book, and, and he thought, I think, he thought I was going to ask him to read it, and he wouldn't be able to. And so he responded like anybody, or particularly for a fighter. I mean, he turned around, and I became the guy, he was pummeling in the corner, and it lasted for about five or ten minutes. And the nicest thing he called me was honky. <laughs> and uh, we didn't part friends. And, uh, and I went to my dressing room and thought, I, I handled it badly. I, I felt that I'd, I'd, and I kind of showed a side of him, too, that in Britain we, we didn't know about. We, didn't, we weren't prepared for it. In America, he divided the nation. In Britain, they loved him, all of them, unequivocally. And there was a knock on the door. And I opened the door, and there's my father, uh, who was a, a Yorkshireman and a, and a miner, and a man of few words, and he said, now then. And I said, now then. And he said, it was a long conversation with my father, and he said, uh, what do you reckon? I said, not much. He said, no, nor did I. He said, can I ask you a question? I said, what's that? He said, why are you thumping? <laughs> <laughs> sure, Dad, yeah, I'd been a jockey, I might have tried, but not 17 stone of professional prize fighter, no. Yeah. It's, I mean, that, it, that very much came out just there. You, you, you sort of speaking about the, the confrontational aspects of yes. your, your, your interviews with Ali. And you actually, an, another interesting quote that I, that I heard of yours, you said that you felt like each, you interviewed him, was it four times? Yes. And, and that each time you lost. <laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> Without shame. a doubt. He was undefeated when he fought me. But I mean, they're all, what's interesting, they're all long interviews. I mean, one went, the confrontational one, one lasted, that lasted an hour and a half. And the, the other three or four, I mean, all lasted an hour. And the one-man shows, which defines the difference, of course, be, uh, between then and now, about what, what's happening on television. You know, it's yeah. all, I mean, if I went even with a Muhammad Ali to, to a, a boss now in television and said, look, I've got this interview with Ali, he'd say, well, could you do it in three minutes, old chap? You know, do a sound bite. Yeah. It's different. Do, do you sort of see interviewing as a battle, or, or is it generally? Or no, just, I mean, no, I mean, it's, it's the opposite. I mean, an interview yeah. is consensual. Uh, it was the last time I looked. <laughs> it, it, uh, it, had to, it has to be consensual, otherwise it doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. When interviews don't work, when you have the disasters like I had so with, say, Meg Ryan, I mean, it's because we didn't like each other. It's very simple. We're, we're, <laughs> <laughs> there's no complicated mystery about it at all. We didn't like each other. It's very simple. And it came across because you have to actually give part of you for that moment in time. You have to agree one to the other that you're going to cooperate. I'm going to ask the questions. Yeah. You're going to ask them. That's the deal. Yeah. If, any, if anybody, if anybody, argue with <laughs> if anybody doesn't go along with that, then then it's not an interview anymore. It becomes a disaster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but but the audience love that, don't they? Because there's nothing the audience like more than to see the host discomfited. It's yeah, called yeah. kill the quarterback. <laughs> Would you perhaps tell us a bit more about what happened with Meg Ryan, just for the people who? Well, uh, there's not much to tell, really. Yeah. Um, I've, I've, I've told you it's the essentials of it. I met her in a dressing room. She had a, a large dressing room, which we reserved normally for rock and rollers, but she was uh, enough room to sort of swing guitars and things. And, but she was at one side of the room, and the entourage was at the other side. So I immediately thought, there's something wrong here. This, this is not quite right. Mm. And uh, I said, good evening to her. And she said, good evening to me. And I said, uh, as I, I said, all the guests, the only question I ever asked them, is there anything you don't want to talk about? She said, I don't want to talk about break of the Russell Crowe. And I said, fine, OK. It doesn't bother me at all. Everything fine. Yeah, ask me what you want, she said. And I left. And I said to my producer, this could be a bit, a bit odd, because she's not actually a very happy person. And she walked out on the show, and I don't know what it was. I mean, I, she just didn't like me, and I didn't like her. Maybe she was, I don't know, was, I don't know what, what was wrong with her. But, I mean, she... <laughs> <laughs> it's a wonderful interview, I think. I don't know what was wrong with her. It wasn't my fault. But, uh, yeah. but I, I just don't know. And, and, of course, it comes to a point in an interview like that, well, because the, 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 the consensual deal is gone, mm. that, you know, all you can do, actually, is just wrap it up, basically. <laughs> because, I mean, you're getting nowhere. Yeah. And that's what we did. Hmm. 
And, who who uh, won, would you say? Oh, I don't think anybody <laughs> won in that situation. The audience won. The draw. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they, they like it. You know, they like that sort of stuff. Yeah. But it's a waste of time, really, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, um, just changing, changing tack, right, slightly. I, um, I wanted to ask you, because I, I suppose I sort of last um, heard about you in the news about a month ago, um, when, uh, about some comments you made about Jade Goody's mm. funeral. I, I mm. think you described as a, a wretched role model. No, I didn't say that at all. Oh, no, no, no. You must get the courts right, otherwise no. the interview is over. No, we... No, no. <laughs> there are no preconditions on this interview at all. But, uh, no, no, what I, what I did say was that she yeah. came to represent all that's wretched in Britain today, and I think that's okay. right. I mean, I was making a statement about, about what television is doing, I perceive television is doing to our society, yes. where it offers up uh, role models like her. Well, if you think that she's an ideal role model, then I may be wrong. Uh, if you think the kind of television that, that bred her and shoved her onto the streets and exploited her, uh, such as Big Brother and shows like that, is, is edifying, is that what television is about? I'm in the wrong business, and I've been in this business for 50 years. Yeah. I, I mean, I would not pay to see the lunatics at Bedlam. I would not pay to see the elephant man. I would not pay to see the, the bearded lady. For the same reason. Why shouldn't I watch a, 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 a people, smarter people laughing at a gang of freaks? Because that's what they're doing. When you cast Big Brother, you don't cast it from the first four people who come through the door. No. You cast it because you want to put people together, some with psychological defects and problems, together so you'll have a mix that you can look at through a, through a spy hole. I don't find that edifying. I don't find that instructive. I don't find it entertaining. And what I've observed in television, and what they don't like me so writing about, is that the smart-ass people who ought to know better, clever people, mm. clever people, very clever people, what clever the, the people they're exploiting, do this and have their, 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 their kind of water cooler moment where they'll laugh about it. I just think, I just think the entire thing is upside down and topsy-turvy. And I think the sooner that we actually look at this, and if we can't see the correlation between Jane Goody as a, road model, or as a role model and what happens in our streets on a Saturday night with girls falling down drunk and that's the more dafter than I think we are, frankly. I mean, yeah, yeah. If, if you're saying that that's what you want to be, then the consequence of that is what you see on a Saturday night in the high street, in my view. Yeah. I don't, might be wrong, but that's what I, that's what I think. Now, so therefore, that's what I said. That's really basically with my attack. The, 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 the media, and I can speak as a journalist for a long, long time, so I know what they do, they distort uh, a sentence and make it like he calls Jane Good at the all. I call it pure owl, but that means, cha <laughs> but, but that means childish. You see, the, 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 that again, I mean, pure is used as a, a kind of a word now, it's lost its meaning. But that's what it, what it meant, and that's how yeah. I meant it. So anyway, that's, that, that was Jay Goody, and, and yeah. I take back not a word of it at all. No, no. Not a word, absolutely not. And I think that we should actually have a debate about it. We should think about it. People who work in television should look down and, and think of the consequences of what we're doing. Yeah. I don't think it's a laughing matter. I really don't. I think it's, it's important. Now, I, I probably sound terribly pompous and terribly old saying that, but that's my view. Mm. And more generally with this, so you're sort of maybe getting at the idea that there's something sort of pernicious about celebrity culture generally. Well, it's futile. I mean, yeah. what is the sense in wanting to be recognised, for God's sake? To walk down the streets and say, oh, look at him. For what reason? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, why? I mean, I, it's, I mean to, you, you become famous if you appear on television or stage or wherever it is. But it's a consequence of that. It's not the reason for being there. Right. And, and if, you, if you actually think that that's the only reason why you want to be famous is to be famous, then you've got a screw loose, quite frankly. Yeah. I mean, I mean it's, it's bad enough. No, it's not bad enough. It's wonderful being famous. I love being recognised. It's, 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 I mean, because people, generally speaking, are very kind and very forthright and, 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 and very upfront with you. And, and it's a nice thing to feel to walk in a store like I did today, walking through Cambridge. A lot of people said hello to me. That's a nice thing to happen. It can be, it can be a pain in the backside sometimes in the pub. And the, brain, and the booze has got to the frontal lobes and, you know, and somebody comes across and starts doing all kinds of things like, would you like me to do the emu on you and all that sort of thing. But, <laughs> but, that, but, but, that, but that again, is a, it's a small price to pay. But the point is this, is that it's only, it's only a, that is because you entered a job not to become famous, but to do a job of work. Yeah. And it's an inevitable consequence of that. For anybody who goes into a job just wanted to be that, Frankly, I mean, and that's exactly, of course, the point that, that these poor devils are at who go in the Big Brother house. I mean, what are they when they come out, apart from famous? Well, where are they now? Yeah, living in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> I was in a, the very first time, what was it called? Nasty Nick, Nasty Ned, yeah. the first one. 
I can see you're an expert. <laughs> you? And I was in a, in a restaurant in London, and a, a, a girl who used to be my PA was sitting in the corner with a man who was turned round facing the wall. And she came across and said hello to me, and I said, what are you doing now? She said, I'm looking after him over there. I said, who's he? Because he's going, what's his back? She said, it's uh, Nasty Nick, or whatever his name was, one big brother. And I said, why is he sitting facing the wall? She said, he doesn't want to be recognised. <laughs> <laughs> I promised him I won't recognise him. He turned around facing me. I said, but, you know, I mean, if you see somebody facing the wall, you're going to look at him in any case, aren't you? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah. I suppose it's sort of the ultimate punishment for, for going on, you know, one thing. These, one you thing know, these people are exploited. But for Jed Goody, it was, it was an interesting case in point. I mean, somebody, uh, a very good dramatist, um, should write a play about this because it's a fascinating subject. Yeah. From the moment she went into the, into the house, her life was scripted by cynical people who used and exploited her. And the only time that she ever, ever came off the page, so to speak, was when she was taken ill. And it was only then that you saw the possibility in the child. It was only then that you saw a nobility, in a sense, in, in the way she dealt with a terrible illness. You saw that. She was off the script. She was off the page. It was only then that she'd been allowed to be herself. The rest of it was contrived and written. Yeah. And I find that really, really sad. Mm. Um, perhaps sort of just going back more generally to the, you know, the many, um, you know, many thousands of people you've interviewed, do, do, you, do you feel that you... Is there anyone that you haven't interviewed but that you wish you had? You well, know? the only one I, I missed was Frank Sinatra. Really? Uh, my great hero. I thought was the greatest star of the 20th uh, and 21st century. Mm. And the best thing a popular song there's ever been, and I'll fight anybody who argues with me on that one. <laughs> and I, I, I never got near him. I got, I got near him once in America. I was taken to a cocktail party by a friend of mine, a songwriter called Sammy Khan. And he took me to meet um, Frank Sinatra, and he said uh, that, you know, if you meet him, he'll know who you are, and the next time he's in England, he might do a show. Because he never did interviews. And I was introduced to him, and he said, Sammy said, uh, Frank, this is Mike Parkinson. He said, Mike, how are you? I said, Mr. Sinatra, how are you? <laughs> and he said, fine. And Sammy said, okay, man. And Sammy moved, Sammy moved on to another party. And I was about, I knew nobody. And I'm wandering around the room, and I thought, well, I've got to go now. So I thought, well, I'll say goodbye to my new best friend now before I leave. <laughs> so I went across to, to Frank Sinatra. I said, Mr. Sinatra, I'm going now. Oh, he said, good to meet you, David. And I thought, no, no, this, isn't, this, isn't, this will not work. <laughs> yeah. So, but that was the nearest I got to him. But he was the only one. I mean, it was a long... I did for a long time, you know. Yeah. And uh, I met most of my heroes. And most of them, I have to say, didn't let me down. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, another thing that sort of struck me is that when you, when you sort of interview people, and, uh, you know, particularly people where they're... What they do for a living involves, like, an element of performance. Do, 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 you, do you feel always that you're sort of getting to know the real them, or, or more of a sort of TV persona? I don't, I mean, I'd, it was never a place for an interrogation. I mean, no. it, it was, I always took the, the view that, that, that in, in the com what you tried to create was a conversation yeah. rather than a formal interview. Because you have to understand that if you're doing a talk show, it's not a formal interview. It's not a John Humphreys. It's not a Paxman. It's a different thing altogether. I always defined it as being interviewing while tap dancing. And it's something like that. There's a showbiz element involved in it, which you have to be aware of. <laughs> And I would try to get it to a, to a conversational level where, where you would actually relax to the point, the guest this is, mm. where you might just feel that there wasn't 500 people in the audience there. Mm. And there wasn't, as it was at its peak, 12, 14 million people out there watching it. That there was just you and, and him or her. And that was the way. And then that way you might actually get into an area where almost, almost by accident they would tell you, say something that that was not in the script, so yeah. to speak. Because the script was, not the script, but the research, it was all there. I mean, the thing you had to do beforehand, and the most important thing of all, you had to go to that, that interview knowing more about them than they knew about themselves. Mm. That was terribly important. And you might only use 10% of that interview, of that material, but you had to have it in case, in case it all went wrong. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's interesting. Oh, good. Um, <laughs> you, the rest of it's been very boring, but that was particularly interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, in a way, it's sort of hard to ask, but I mean, 
because you've obviously interviewed so many people, you know, apart from Frank Sinatra, um, is there anyone else you'd, you'd single out, you know, perhaps other than Muhammad Ali? Well, I mean, I, I, one of the great joys is get to meet people like Nelson Mandela. I mean, Mandela mm. was, was, a, was a, a hero of mine. I was, I was quite active as a journalist during the apartheid debate over South Africa, and particularly the question of English, England playing cricket to get over there. And mm. I was banned from South Africa for a while, and... And then I was allowed to go back, of course, when Mandela was out, and, and I met the great man, and that was a that was a wonderful, a wonderful occasion. He was a. There are certain people you meet, you know, that I've met anyway. I'm not in any, in any uh, way a mystical kind of fellow at all, but there are people who have a certain personality, a force, a willpower within them, something, whatever it is. It might I don't know what it is, but it's, it's, it's extraordinary. Ali had it. Uh, Billy Connolly has it. Um, really? mm, Richard Burton had it. Uh, and then Mandela certainly had it. I mean, it was a, a sense in which you had your back to it, but you knew he'd have walked into the room. There was something about it. And, you know, and I'm not, I'm not, they were very sort of mystical, arty farty about this, but it, there was something there. And he didn't lay you down again. He was the most remarkable man. Yeah. But that's been the nice thing about this job, is meeting these people, you know. Yeah, yeah. and did, did you feel that you got that same feeling from, from all of them, that, you know, that, that sort of presence? No. No. no, just the ones I've handled. I, I've, I've talked about. Most, right, most yeah. people, when they walk on, it's a very interesting, actually, dynamic. Yeah. Is that no matter who they were, no matter how many shows they've been in, how many times they've been in a big movie or whatever it might be, no matter how many times they've been on stage at Covent Garden, whatever, when they walked on, they were nervous. You yeah. could see it in their eyes. You could see it in their, the way they weren't, slightly, they weren't really focusing. And you could see by the body language when they sat down, they all sat like that. Mm -hmm. And it would take at least three, four minutes, five minutes, before you might <coughs> relax and you could see the sea change in their eyes. And then you knew that you're in with half a chance. If it didn't happen, you might as well all go home. Mm. It would be like talking to an Easter Island effigy. I mean, it's, it, but, but, it, but in the main, that was your first job to do, to convince them that they were in a car with a safe driver, basically. <laughs> Something yeah. like that. And once they didn't start to relax, then you could start work. Yeah. But it's about body language. I mean, you know, when, as soon as they move from, I'm doing it sitting like this because I can't sit any other way in this silly chair. <laughs> but the, the, but the, the fact is that we had chairs that were straight backed. Yeah. So you, you couldn't, I mean, I used to, <laughs> Jonathan Miller would do that. that. But, but in the main, what you wanted to do was to see that movement. And once you got that movement forward, yeah. then you, you more or less, you'd, you'd, you'd hook them in a sense. You've yeah. got them. So would that be sort of your technique at the start of an interview? You'd try and relax them and try and make them... When, when, I, was, when I was a, a journalist writing features in Fleet Street for the Daily Express, when it was like the glamorous paper in Fleet Street, I had a wonderful featured editor, a man called ha Howard, Harold Keeble. And he was given the best advice I, I've ever had. And uh, he would say to you, come here, and he would have on his, on his page display in his office a, a title, let us say it would be... Falling in love, right? That would be the nothing underneath. It. What do you think about that? It was a piece of design. Wonderful. Right, go away. 3,000 words by tea time. You have to write 3,000 words about it. But what he would do then, he took the stuff in, he'd look at it, and it, all the time he'd take the first three paragraphs out like that. And I said, why are you doing that? He said, because that's garbage. It starts there. Always starts three parts in. And he was right. And it's exactly the same with a TV interview. You can chuck away the first five minutes. It doesn't matter. You start then. Because yeah. the, what, what, the process beforehand is, is kind of psychological as much as anything else. It's not really verbal. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, just, just maybe a final question for me. Um, it's what Alistair Cook said. I mean, yeah. was it this university or was that? Or Oxford, the other place. Alistair. But, but, the, uh, but he had a, he had a, Does a, anyone know? <laughs> he had a tutor called uh, Q. Sir Arthur Kula Cooch, who yeah. wrote novels under the name of Q. And he told me that he had this, this thing where he, uh, he, 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 wrote, he took this essay into Cooch and, and into, into Q and uh, Kula Cooch, and, 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 and he was convinced it was, it was the greatest essay ever written by a, a human being since the beginning of time. <laughs> and he went in to see Cooch, who was getting dressed for dinner. And he was standing in his underpants with one leg in his thing, like this, and he said to... to, to, to Cook, he said, I suppose you've come for praise. <laughs> and Cook said, as a matter of fact, I have. And he said, my dear Cook, he said, first of all, you must learn how to murder your darlings. <laughs> and what he was saying to Cook was, it's overwritten. You're showing off. There's vanity in this piece. 
And that's exactly what there is in, in, in every kind of piece of journalism. That's what you have to learn to take out as you go along. Yeah. That's why most people become, in any sense, they're better writers as they're older than when they're younger, because they're not showing off anymore. So our musicians will tell you, and singers will tell you, because they take out that which is not unnecessary and concentrate on that which is there, has to be there. Yeah. It's very interesting. It's similar in an interview, too. Mm. Um, do, do you think this might be a good point to take questions from the floor? Are you bored with me? No, no, no. <laughs> Just giving all the, these poor people a chance to... I think just... They don't look like poor people to me, yes. <laughs> 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 well, then I'm, a, I'm a humble lad from Barnsley. I don't know about these places. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. yeah, you talk about Ali going on a few fights too long, mm. and then it was a very open book about the right moment to quit, mm. which is just at your feet, but before it starts to all. Mm. What was the moment? What decided you to go to the chapter? Of the game? Well, it, it was interesting. I mean, I was enjoying the last series more than I enjoyed any series before, but I wasn't enjoying working with the people I was working with. It had changed. The problem with being in an industry for as long as I have, you see fundamental change. I mean, I, 50 years ago, you know, when I was a current affairs reporter, if we went abroad to film, so as we did, say, in the Congo or somewhere like that, you know, you had to get your film and wrapped in a tin, then you put the tape around it, then you go to the airport, and I fond hope you might find a British Airways pilot with a large, large moustache who used to fly mozzies or, or spitfires, and give it to him and say, look, could you please take that back to the BBC in London? That's how we used to do it. Now, you stand there, you take your mobile phone out like that, you hit a satellite and say, good evening. I mean, that's how it's changed. Uh, and, and so there's a different breed now, people running it. And, and I just felt kind of left out by all, by all that, in, in a sense. Now, in my area, it wasn't that technological reform that, that had so much changed. Ex but what had changed was with the kind of people who have been brought in to, to see that phase through. So my mentors when I came into television were journalists, like-minded people, because the only way that television could recruit in those days was from Fleet Street or wherever it might be. So I grew up uh, among an assembly of men and women who I understood, who I had a common parlance with. That changed, and, and you know, I became increasingly feeling like sort of left out, in a sense. So rather than be that, that bore in the corner, say, you know, I was a lad and all that sort of stuff, <laughs> I decided to get out. I mean, uh, and I'm young enough and vigorous enough to, to actually think of doing other things as well. I mean, I'd had an amazing run in that show. I really had. I mean, you know, and, and I'd, I'd, I'd thought, actually, if I hadn't left then, I'd, I'd have given it one more year only. But that was the real reason. I just felt sort of, sort of kind of discomforted by, by the surroundings, in a sense. That was the only reason. Mm. So. Um, is there any historical character to oh, Guy Fawkes. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to do him now, wouldn't you? He had the right idea, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the man's a prophet. I mean, uh, should celebrate him in song and dance. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, they, no, I, I, I'd, I'd love to have interviewed Oliver Cromwell. Mm. Um, and the people living, of course, I'd love to interview the Queen. But, I mean, when you think of what she's seen, what she's observed, what she's been through in all her reign, if she only should talk about it, one, she never will, of course, but I mean, it's, just a, it's a dream. I think most Germans would say that. What have you taken from your cricketing career to your professional career? What have I taken from my, well, as it was my cricketing career. Well, my cricketing career was, was uh, full of expectation, but not much, not much triumph for it in reality. I, I, so I played with Geoffrey Boycott and uh, Dickie Bird at Barnsley in the Yorkshire League, and uh, we would sit on the pavilion. Geoffrey was about three years younger than I am. Dickie's a year older than I am. And we sit as three teenagers, on, young teenagers too, 14, 15, so, on this balcony outside the ground at Barnes, overlooking the, the town. And we talk about our, our, uh, our futures, what we wanted to do, and, and Geoffrey Boycott went on to play for Yorkshire and England, as he knew he would, and... Uh, and we all want to play for Yorkshire, and, and Dickie played for Yorkshire and Leicester. And I always say, I grew up and was attacked by an emu. And that's, <laughs> so, I mean, uh, I suppose I'm, I'm the failure in the, of those three. No, it was, it was a dream. I mean, everybody, every boy child born in Yorkshire in those days had a father who believed the greatest honour the family could ever have is if their child played for Yorkshire. Korean. I mean, and it was perfectly true in those days that the White Rose of Yorkshire was more coveted than the three lines of England. I mean, if you, 
if you became a Yorkshire player in those days, you were you were like a Welsh rugby player. I mean, you were, you were idolised. So, but, but, I mean, I wasn't good enough, basically. And just think, I mean, had I actually f could fulfil my career, I ended up at the age of 35 with a sweet shop in Barnsley or somewhere like that. <laughs> so I think I've, I, did the, I made the right choice. There was never actually much... I mean, I, mean I, I toyed with being a cricketer, but I always knew I wanted to be a journalist. And we were talking at, at dinner about this, and I was saying that it was very interesting in those days. I mean, I could leave school at 16, as I did, and go and serve an apprenticeship in a local newspaper and have a job for life. I mean, that was guaranteed. I mean, there was no question of, like, you sign up for two months and then go away and come back another three months later. And I was saying that today that one of the problems, it seems to me, with young people um, leaving universities, for instance, and, and going, let's just say, into journalism, is that that deal is not there anymore. You know, there are jobs to be had, but not with that kind of basis, not with that kind of foundation, not with that kind of certainty. It's a much different world. Sir? Um, has your interviewing style changed much, do you think, since you started, and what tips could you give? I think age changes you, in a sense, in that it changes people's response to you. I mean, when I first started in the talk show, I mean, I've been interviewing all my life, but certainly when I started in the talk show, I was about 35 or something like that, and, and I could flirt with any Hollywood star who came on, and I did. By God, I did. <laughs> I, mean, I flirted with some beautiful women, Shirley MacLaine particularly, who were in the middle of one serious question I was trying to ask her to, to prove to her I was an intellectual as well as a, as a babe magnet. Um, <laughs> she, she reached forward. And she, had, she was a beautiful-looking woman, those gorgeous blue eyes. And she reached forward, and she was like this with her finger, and I thought, where's this going? And she shoved it in my... And I had a shirt button undone there. And she shoved it in my belly button, and she went like that. And so I said, <laughs> now I went red, purple, green, and blue. <laughs> and she said, uh, you've got a button missing. And I said, oh, I, I'm terribly sorry. Yeah, she said, uh, the wife sews them on, and we pop them off. <laughs> and from that point on, we had an affair. I mean, in the, in the studio, that is. And, uh, and t so much so that to the point where Many, many years later, maybe 15 years later, Warren Beatty came on the show. And he came in and sat down and said, Are you the guys trying to make out with my sister? <laughs> I had to admit I was. But, uh, so, the, but the serious point is that, uh, that, you, that you... So therefore, you, it, it changes the dynamic in the relationship between you and the guest. So now, when the equivalent of Shirley MacLaine, let's say Renny Zellweg, who I adore, walks on, then... I can't do any of that, because I look like a dirty old man. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, I, you know, I was dribbling. <laughs> so I wait for them to do it. <laughs> no, no, but, it's, but that's, a, that's a silly example, maybe. But, but it's, it proves the point, that, that the older you get, then people who are on with you, or in the main, maybe younger than you now, uh, whereas they were the same age when I was older, treat you differently. So that dynamic changes. And I think also, too, we were talking there, answering a question there about... Interviewing. I think there may be two that you, you get more confident and you get to know what to leave out and you don't get as discomforted maybe in situations that you did before. And I think, again, the other thing, too, that you take out of performance, and I think that all people who are on stage, television, or wherever, and writing again, go, we go back to again and again, is, is this thing about you lose vanity. You lose that, that sense of, of that thing. I remember when I, I used to walk on, first of all, I think, God, I am the dog's dinner. You know. <laughs> and then you think, that's oh, stupid, that is. And what you do then is you, go on, you have to learn to do a job in a very, very phony set of circumstances with lights on you and microphones all over the place and do, do a basic job. And you learn that gradually over the years and you become better because of that, actually. So. I was going to go back to your early life, sorry. Uh, I was wondering, you said you always wanted to be a journalist. Mm. I was wondering, as the Yorkshire lad with uh, two O levels, how you, how you have got your career, your fantastic career that you ended up with, how that journey... Well, I, I, I never thought there was a direct link between education and success. No, it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> You're not here to prove it. I mean, it's... Uh, <laughs> but no, no, I... I no, was, uh, I mean, I, I wasn't stupid. I mean, I went to grammar school. I mean, I passed the... No, no. No, no, I, I take your point. I take your point. I, I, it's, uh, it was possible in those days, is the answer. It is possible. I, I mean, I, I was rescued by my generation, rescued by the 1945 Education Act, which meant for the first time ever 
uh, young, bright, working class kids could go to secondary education without having to pay for it. So I was the first, in that first batch, who were allowed to do that. And we created the 60s. Um, and we created the social revolution that happened in Britain in that time. Because when you educate people from that strata of society for the first time, stand back, because they're going to have different ambitions and things. And we did. So that was the first thing that, that happened. And also, too, it was a great help that I'd, 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 I had an ambition to be a journalist. But more than that, that I, I read from a very early age, and I, read, I could read quite fluently from the age of five. And my parents would bring, my mother would bring me books. I mean, I, I read all of Hemingway and Steinbeck before I was 12 or 13. You know, I mean, I, I just had this voracious appetite for reading. And so I learned how to write by doing that. And so I, I'd always had that, that ability to, 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 to write, to express myself. Um, and and that, that, was, that was all I needed. Uh, so it wasn't self-belief? You, you didn't believe in I didn't, I didn't know where I was going. But I knew I wanted to be a journalist. And I started off cycling around a nest of pit villages, 25 miles a day, collecting all the garbage of village life, you know, the pigeon results and all that sort of stuff. But then you moved on. And you moved on. And I moved to Fleet Street and the Manchester Guardian, first of all. That was my education. That was my university, if you like, Manchester Guardian. Because it was a fine paper. It's still a fine paper. It was a very fine paper in those days. And, uh, and, and then television happened. And, you know, I was in at the very beginning of television. I arrived in in Granada, uh, only a year after Coronation Street. You know, I go right the way that far back. Um, <laughs> and, and, and again, you see, Granada, I mean, it was an extraordinary time. I've been so lucky in my career. Timing is everything. We talked about Ali earlier, who gave me that boost of this great man on call for 10 or 11 years, um, which, in a sense, made the show, made the reputation of the show. And, and to Granada, too, I mean, it was, it was, it was a time we had, the Beatles were our resident group. We had these four young men in the studio. We didn't know they were the Beatles. They didn't know they were the Beatles. They got no idea. Until one day, John Lennon said to us, we're going to, to, live, uh, to London to make a record. And when they came back, 10,000 kids chased them through Manchester, and the world of music stood on its head. And uh, it was all happening there. And then Bestie arrived. I mean, as if that wasn't it. We had all these actors and writers and poets and everything there. In this melting pot, which was Granada Television at that time, then Best arrived. And nobody had ever seen anything like him. I mean, we take for granted now that football is a superstar, but in those days, I mean, it wasn't the case at all. And so that was a wonderful... I was very, very lucky. Very lucky indeed. It's all about timing. <laughs> mm. Anybody else? Sir, so, right at the back there. You said um, you weren't impressed by celebrity culture on TV. I was wondering what sort of culture you'd like to see instead, what sort of... New culture and what sort of changes? I, I don't. I don't. I, I, I take the celebrity culture as being as being a um, part of the scenery. Now I don't think there's any way to change it. To go back uh, to do it, it would take a terrible uh, uh, decision on behalf of the tabloid press and tabloid television to go that way. I mean, they, 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 all the signs are now, particularly with ITV, is that that's the way they're going forever and, and a day. I mean, ITV was once the equal of BBC. It had to be, and that's when we had the, one of the best television services in the world. It's now decided, for lots of reasons, a lot of financial reasons too, that it's, good, it's going to concentrate on this kind of celebrity show, and that's it. Well, that's half of the, of the or the third of the, of the major broadcasting in this country going down that path. I don't think I'm going to, 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 to stop it. I, I just want to indicate to people that maybe, you know, there is a choice. There is, a, there is something else there. The only hope we've got, quite frankly, as an alternative, is the BBC which is why you should treasure the BBC. You know, the fact of the matter is when they talk about getting rid of the, of the license fee, and I think the, the license fee could be cut down, quite frankly, but that's another story. But, but when you talk about that, then ask, answer me this question, who would buy Radio 4? Well, I mean, you know, it's, it's one of the great national treasures we've got. And, and, and we've still got, with, through the BBC, predominantly brilliant television. But the fact of the matter is that, that that's, it's half of what it used to be. But there's no change now, I don't think, to this, this celebrity thing at all. I mean, it'll be a phase in the sense it will, it will naturally die of death, I think. It'll, it'll fade out um, because they'll, they'll run out of... People will get bored with the notion and the ideas. I mean, when you think about it, I mean, these people who represent what we're talking about, they're hardly fascinating people to talk to, are they? <laughs> have you had them here? I bet you have. <laughs> <laughs> have you had Kerry here? Oxford Union. Oxford Union, was it? <laughs> ah. Ah. Have you had any, uh, any of those, those people here at all? I mean, you... Who? Oh? <laughs> no, I mean, it's, uh, but it's, you know, listen, 
It's just I get grumpy about things like that. <laughs> and I'm allowed to be grumpy. I've been in the business long enough. I look at it from a different, a different perspective than people as well. I mean, I look at it from a, a, a profession I've been delighted and proud to be part of for a long, long time. And I have, I have a kind of uh, uh, almost a protective sort of feeling about it. I don't want it to change too much from what it was. We once had the best. That's no longer true. So I think that's something we should, we should be worried about, should concern us. Anybody else? Sir? Oh, madam. <laughs> it's lovely to be in the audience for your interviews with Paul McCartney for BBC and ITV. All right. Could you tell me which of those you prefer? Because they're quite different in style. I think the BBC one I, I, I like most of all. Yeah. Well, that was a one-man show in McCartney that we did, wasn't it? Where he sang yesterday. Yeah. Uh, no, it's, it's lovely. Um, we're going through all those shows now. I mean, there's 800 of them. And we're bringing out a DVD next, next year, uh, next uh, autumn, uh, which will be the best of. So it's a, it's a three sets of uh, DVD. And he'll be in that. Yeah. I mean, I liked him immensely. But, uh, you know, we've known him for a long time because, you know, he was, as I said, our, our resident group at Granada. His mother once asked me for my autographs. So it's my greatest tent of fame. <laughs> Uh, say again, sorry. You lost against Muhammad Ali, mm. and you drew with Meg Ryan. Who did you beat? <laughs> I didn't ever a contest. Like that. <laughs> I uh, no, I, I, I didn't. I didn't draw with Meg Ryan. I think I probably lost with Meg Ryan as well. <clears throat> but, um, I mean, it's, it's not a contest, uh, an interview. It's, as I said, it's got to be something different to, to that. If it were that contest, I mean, I, I wouldn't have lasted as long as I did. I'd be absolutely knackered after about two years, I think. Uh, um, there. Um, did you ever feel like your show was being exploited by the guests who came on it to publicise themselves or their latest film or something like that? I understand the question. Uh, it's a question you get put all the time about the plug show and that sort of thing. Well, let me put it another way. Um, if you had, uh, uh, let's say, you wanted to get Madonna on the show, which we did for an hour, did five songs. Well, if you actually said to Madonna's management, we want to do Madonna and five shows, they would say, start talking the million dollars. Uh, and that's for her, never mind for the rest. The deal is, when a record comes out, you play one track from a record, and she performs it, she'll do four other tracks and other stuff, so, some of her back catalogue, and you talk for an hour for um, five grand, something like that, it's a standard fee. Well, what's the deal? Come on. I mean, that's the way it works. That's the way the world goes round in television and, and the plug market. The, the thing to do was to get the plug out of the way as soon as possible. If the book came on, don't, don't pretend that that, that that person, that Tom Cruise sitting opposite, is not there to talk about his book, because he is. Get rid of it in the intro. Mention it. That's all they want to mention. Don't try to, to pretend they're there because they love you, because that's not true. So, so, they, so that's, that's the deal. That's the deal. And it works very, very well indeed. And, and when you get people, if you have time with people, as I used to have, I mean, my shortest interview would be 20 minutes, my longest an hour or so, then you, you've got time to get rid of all that very quickly and then move into other areas and do a proper interview. Nowadays, it becomes more apparent, I think, because they don't do a longer interview. So it looks like the entire 10 minutes is a plug. So that's, the, that's, the, that's one of the problems. But I never was never embarrassed by that at all. I was d delighted. I mean, to do an hour with Fred Astaire for nothing was an, I mean, something else. Sir? Do you think you were a better flirt than George Best? No, nobody was a better flirt than George Best. No, I, I, see, I, was, I was probably a better flirt than George Best because George didn't do too much flirting, I have to say. <laughs> he was, he didn't, I don't think he understood the meaning of the, of the word at all. He was a full frontal with George. Yes. Um, obviously, broadcasting has changed in the past 50 years. Yes. And recently, with the notorious phone calls made by Russell Brand and Jonathan Ross, mm. we can see that it's now becoming more about the broadcaster and less about the audience. Mm. And do you think that this is perhaps a crisis in broadcasting itself? I mean, a, a crisis. I mean, I think that the, the Brand thing was very interesting. I mean, it, it exposed certain different ways in which television is, is operated now. It goes back to the question where I was asked earlier about why I left television. One of the problems now is that, you, it's not a problem, but, but the, the, when the BBC broke up its great publishing empire and handed out a lot of its stuff to independents, it created within that a very complicated system of check and counterbalance. 
And that's what happened with, with, uh, with, with Brand. I mean, in the old days, the old BBC producer, if you'd have put forward that idea to some producer I worked with, you would have been frog-marched out of the building before it ever got into the, uh, beyond the idea stage. I mean, you would literally would never, would never have worked again. But because nowadays the stars like Brand have their own production company and become their own producers, and their producers are merely ciphers, the, the real boss, the real talent, is there, then that control has gone. And what you have at the BBC then is a system of checks, you know, tick off, tick off, tick off, tick off, going forever, to people who aren't really concerned about it. I mean, they, they don't listen to it, they don't watch it, they don't, not there when it's done. So it becomes a kind of formality. So it goes down the line and that appalling thing was allowed to happen. Yeah, well, that's, that's, that's the way you, that's what happens when you change the system and don't put an adequate one back in its place. It's not a crisis, I mean, he should have his brains tested if he's got any. Uh, and, and, and Jonathan Ross, quite frankly, I mean, who's, who's a, a good lad and, a, and I think a, a very fine performer on television and radio, I, I cannot understand why Jonathan got involved with that. I mean, I really cannot. I mean, he's a whimsical fellow at times, but I didn't think that he would go on with something as blatantly stupid as that, which was bound to end in, in tragedy <laughs> or tears, not tragedy, and did. How did you um, perfect your technique? How did you try and convey what you wanted to to your audience? What was your message? By having people on the show who I wanted on the show. I mean, if you do a show that's called Parkinson, or you do a radio show called Parkinson, or you write a column called Parkinson, then, then you know, it's about you, it's about your taste. You can't pretend to be somebody that you're not. You can't pretend to have on people who you don't... No, it's not respect to someone. Word. I had to have people on who I was interested in. I had lots of people on the show I didn't like at all, but by God, I was interested in them. And that's what you have to do. Then the audience who will grow up with you, know exactly what you are, what you're about, what your tastes are, what your music is, and all that sort of thing. And they either like it or they don't. And they either watch it or they don't. I mean, that's the deal. But you can't concoct, you can't program, you can't devise uh, a scheme whereby you're going to bring in all the people at all the time. And you can only make a show for like-minded people. That's my view. Mm. There, sir. Madam. There was a man next to you, I'm sorry, but I didn't make it. <laughs> 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 I've sat and cried with you as you've interviewed and liked Billy Donnelly on the show. When you were laughing so much and you were being recorded, do you ever feel the need to have to cut Billy and say, well, you can control yourself? Or how do you? No, 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 no. <laughs> No, I mean, I mean, there, there are times when I love to cut the film and then it comes across as false laughter, which we all do at times, because it's a very heightened situation in the studio and you, you, everything is bigger and larger and, you know, and, and more of a quiver than it is in normal life. And you sort of tend to laugh too heartily at certain things. But with Connolly, it was a genuine thing that I don't think anybody's ever made me laugh more than Billy, and still does. Uh, he's an extraordinary man. And... Uh, and has this great, great gift of, of, of making people laugh. And I just, I mean, I've, I've known him now for a long, long time. I've interviewed him about eight or ten times on the show. And, uh, and I just think he's the, he's the greatest comedian. Well, he's not a comedian. It's difficult to define what Billy is. But the greatest entertainer that I've ever interviewed, I think. Yeah. An extraordinary man. And now looks ex wonderful. He's, he's, I saw him two weeks ago. He's got white, he's totally white, he's white and John the Baptist down the back and, <laughs> and white all over. He looks, he looks wonderful, he looks ethereal. Anybody else? Anybody? Yeah, I was going to ask about uh, Billy Connolly as well. Um, the famous, his first interview where he talks about the man who, uh, who killed his wife and used her, uh, her ass as a bike stand. That's uh, right. <laughs> how was that, uh, how was that received like, from your point of view? But it made Billy's name. I mean, one joke actually made him turn him from overnight, from you know being a guy. He would have done it in any case, but we just accelerated the process. And his, his Billy came to my dressing room before the show started and said to me, "I'm incredibly nervous, man." And I said, "Fine, you know, you'll, you'll be okay." I said, "You know, just relax." He said, no, "I've got a joke," and I said, "What's it?" So he told me the joke, that joke. And I said, what are you telling me it for now? He said, well, uh, when I get away with it. I said, yeah, if you smile when you tell it, you'll get away with it, don't worry. <laughs> I said, it's a, funny, it's a funny joke. And he did it, and of course, it, it was, I mean, overnight, he became one of only two people who would put two million viewers, extra viewers on the show. He and Ali were the two that did that. 
just build them and you've got an extra two million viewers. It was quite extraordinary. But the BBC were terrified of him. I mean, um, they didn't quite know how to use him. They wanted, but they knew they got something that was, that was exceptional, but they didn't know how to place him because Billy, you know, he's not front of cloth and he's not alternative and all that, so he's, he's different. And eventually they, they devised a scheme whereby, and don't ask me why, they put him in a circus tent on Clapham Common. Now, I mean, I don't know. Again, more bizarre than Billy Connolly in a circus tent on Clapham Common. And uh, it, it, it's kind of, it was okay, got away with it. But Bill has never, ever been used on television in anything other than a talk show as a comedian. It's quite extraordinary. I mean, you think about his, he's done one or two guest appearances, but he's never had the Billy Connolly show. And you think, wouldn't you, with somebody of that talent, that somebody would have devised a, a means of doing it. I think he's quite content not to have that, actually. I certainly am, because the only way you could see him was on the show. Anyway, there. Then I formed a relationship with. No, I mean, I didn't go around, you know, like, David Frost is assiduous. David has got a book that thick. And he's got everybody's in it. Every Prime Minister, every President has ever been. Uh, every film star and all that. I, I couldn't be, I couldn't end up time to do that at all. Uh, met, of course, you meet some people like Billy, you meet, and like, you know, about half a dozen other people that I've met who have, I've been friendly with. Um, but um, um, I didn't never use it as a kind of a calling card at all. I had just simply had too much to do. I mean, I, I've, I've always had, apart from, uh, from, news, from uh, television, I've had radio and newspapers and things like that. So I just really haven't had the time to socialize. I'm not a very good social animal in that sense. I don't like, I never go to first nights. I don't like them. I think they're bad and boring. I hate cocktail parties. I'm a real Yorkshire bore, actually. <laughs> and I've got my own pub now. And, uh, and <laughs> it's a very exclusive pub. There's only me in it. <laughs> and a restaurant. And so I, I, I lead a kind of family life, you know. We've got all the family now. We've got eight grandkids and they're all within a three-mile radius of us now. So it's like it was when I first started. I mean, I lived in a, in a pit village where, you know, when I come home from, from school, my mother worked and my dad worked, of course, and I would walk 100 yards from my house to where my two grandparents lived next door to each other. My only problem was I had to get past three aunties who lived on the same road <laughs> who would all feed me tea. So I'd arrive at my grandparents, number one grandparents, for tea, having had three already. That was four. And the next one, I had five. I should be, I should be huge. <laughs> I should be a huge fat man. So, but I like that, I like that. So we've now got that, we've gone back to that, basically. And it's, uh, it's a nice, nice sort of circle. Uh, as, I, as I sail toward my dotage. Should we take maybe one or two more questions before we wrap up? All right, there. <coughs> um, how would you find the looking at us on the three changes? Starting to interview. Um, do I, after an interview, how much it changes? Is the question of how much does it change after sometimes? Well, they, it, if your research has been good, there should be nothing in the interview that surprises you. If there is, sat the researcher. Uh, but I mean, the, 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 but sometimes, as I was saying earlier, there can come into an interview a, a, a moment where, for some whatever reason, the person sitting opposite you tells you something that you, it wasn't in research. And then you have to filter that and think, well, is that really interesting? And that's, what, what do I do with that and go with it or not? Um, as to, I mean, the, the other thing, too, is that I, I've started off both ways, not liking some people on the page and, and liking them immensely when I've done the interview and vice versa, and vice versa, too. But not too many uh, disappointments, no. The most terrible thing, I mean, my wife still tells this story, it's awfully going back to this meeting people and then socialising. I, I, I think that Clint Eastwood is a great film director. I think he's made some wonderful movies. And he's a great giant of modern cinema. And I always wanted to meet him. He's one of my real heroes. And he's not a great interviewer. He's a very quiet man, and, but, a, but, a, but, a, but a nice, very pleasant man, a deeply pleasant man. And my wife, who loved him for longer than I dare tell him, um, was, came to the show. And after the, the show I did with him, I did two interviews, one at the BFI, I went to the BBC, and afterwards we were both a bit tired, and I walked into his dressing room with Mary to introduce Mary to him. And he said, hi, Mary, how are you? And then he said to me, he said, look, you, you like jazz, don't you? I said, yeah. He said, my son Kyle's playing down at Ronnie Scott's tonight. He said, well, you and Mary like to come have some dinner and go down to Ronnie Scott's? And I said, I heard myself say, 
Oh, do you mind? I'm, I'm a bit tired. I think I'll go home and have another night. My wife, my wife has never forgiven me for that. <laughs> you stupid man, she said. We've got ourselves. Why do you say that? And I don't know why I said <laughs> Clint Eastwood. Oh, yeah. I'm a failure, really. <laughs> I see what I mean. So, a couple more questions. One more. Anybody? There's, there. You said your guest was nervous. You know, it's a world interview. It's a very good question. You're not allowed to be nervous as the, as the host. Uh, you are, of course. I mean, you get a very big adrenaline surge. Very big. And, and, the, and, and you, but you cannot allow yourself to be seen by them to be nervous because otherwise the, the game is up. You know, and so you can't have a sweaty palm and you can't be like this. So you have to learn to control that, that adrenaline and, 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 and appear at least, you know, uh, calm. Um, the thing I used to love, strangely enough, charged me up, and, but calm me at the same time was the band, the big band. So I love big bands. You know, a big band has a physical quality to it. I mean, it literally hits you in the back, the sound of it. It's extraordinary. It goes through your body. And I'd always say to him, the lead trumpet player, blow me on. And he'd go, oh, it'd be wonderful. I'm thinking of making a comeback, actually. But my idea is this, is that I just do 20 walk-ons, and that's all. So I walk on, say, good evening, walk on, and then come up top of the stage, because that would be my real buzz. That would be my fix for the next 10 years. <laughs> so it really would be. Okay. Well, thank you for, for being a marvellous audience and for listening so patiently to me burbling on. Um, <laughs> and uh, I've much enjoyed being here tonight. I've had several invitations over the years. It's been the first time I've, I've actually come here and uh, I've really, really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Thank you.